Okay, so what the crap just happened? Let's take a look. So, let's zoom in on this. First of all, the thing that I was testing here, I was actually testing two things. One, this is my first set of infinities on this frame. It's the OpenPPG SP140, so it's an electric paramotor. And I had my concerns about doing infinities on this frame, and I thought, you know, either the seat board is going to crack or the swing arms are going to bend. And right off the bat, you can tell, right on my first rotation, look at this swing arm right here, bend, right there. First rotation, and it did not stand a chance. So I'll be getting some new swing arms, probably get some custom made that are strong, that can handle those kind of G-forces. Uh, the other thing that I was going to test is the strength of these three-ring systems. Now, the proper way to test these would obviously have been to take a dyno and a press or a jack or something to test the limits of these three-rings. Um, and I was kind of concerned about it. I mean, this motor, it's heavy, and when you put 8 Gs on it, you know, it puts it in danger, you know. So I wanted to see if they would survive an infinity, and they they survived. Spoiler alert, they're actually totally okay. And I was totally ready to accept whatever outcome of failure I might experience, whether that be the three ring failing, or whether that be my swing arms bending or the seaboard cracking. I had all the safety measures in place to recover from either of those situations. You know, if I had a tangled up mess, I could throw my reserve. Um, I was totally willing to accept that as an outcome. Keep watching this. Um, I had a premature failure. Not a failure. I'll explain what went on exactly, but here at about 27 seconds, you can kind of see what's going on. Let's zoom in further. All right, so there's a cable running up the back of each three ring release. Ignore this loop of yellow right here, but the thing that we're gonna focus on is this strip of yellow right here. There's a yellow cable running up the back and it extends up probably about to here. Maybe it's a good at least five inches extra you know, five inches of margin there, so I could pull it five inches and nothing will happen, but past five inches is when it will release. So you can see here, this one on this side, you can tell it has plenty and it's hidden behind the riser, but this side, look at this, we've only got maybe two and a half, two inches of excess on this side, and so what in the world is happening here? And you can see, some more rotations go by, and it gets shorter. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, now it's really short. Now you can't even see it. Now it's probably only an inch and a half. Now it's right behind the riser, and I think you can see it poking out right there again. So it's getting shorter and shorter. So this side is about to go any moment now. Maybe one more rotation. I lied. One more. Nope. There it is. So finally that cable got short enough that it released my entire left side. And it just so happens that left side was also the side connected to my static line. So you can see this this line right here is a static line, and this static line connects the paraglider riser to my pins, also to the free bag inside of this container, which pulls out my base canopy. So with this scenario, I'm only expecting a huge mess. Um, you can see one side of my glider stays attached, the other side comes up, rips the riser and the brake out of my hand. Base canopy comes out in the free bag. Everything separates. 
Notice the free bag is still in clean air. It didn't go up into the glider up here like I thought it might. Check this out also. This is funny. This riser here kind of gets caught in my face. Now, this did not hurt at all. I was not in free fall at this point. I'm still flying half a glider. So this opening of the base canopy was very, very soft. And I have no marks on my face. I didn't feel anything on my face afterwards. Um, but what was happening here is since I'm tumbling, I'm doing these forward rotations, obviously. I'm doing these front flips with my body over and over. So I keep that inertia. And with the glider surging, now I'm face down. So this base canopy, that's why it hit me in the face. Just the riser, at least. But, you know, this is this is a trade-off that I'm totally willing to accept. I'd rather have a riser slap me in the face and to have this kind of deployment system. But you can see this deployment went pretty well, actually. It kind of just all fell out of the bag and it inflated. Um, you can see I'm, I'm reaching down for my reserve at this point, and I hold my hand on it for a little bit thinking about what I should do and at some point I realize I've got two parachutes out and so I'm like okay I'm just gonna take my chances and I'm gonna see what happens when I just get rid of one of them so I go for the cutaway handle and see this gliders flying circles around me so I finally find the cutaway handle I pull it uh-oh, nothing's happening, right? So <laughs> this uh, this three ring right here, you can see this largest ring, is wrapped around the riser of the base canopy. and So because it's wrapped around this riser, you know, it, it's not wanting to come out. But finally it does. It, it works its way around. You can see that this ring passing through right here, you can see the ring poking out right here at the tip of the mouse. It's just being prevented from being pulled through by this riser. So finally it, it finds its way through and it detaches and now the glider is almost free. Check this out, this is kind of funny. Check out that snag hazard right there. That good old GoPro, right? Right on the bungee of my brake. And it broke the bungee of the brake. The GoPro is still on my head. So good job on your sticky mounts, GoPro. That's pretty impressive. That bungee's pretty thick. <laughs> anyway, so now I'm totally separated from my paraglider, and I'm like, what in the world? I cannot believe that just happened. So I stash my hand all between my legs, and I fly the canopy down to land, and my attention immediately shifts towards where my glider's going to go. And I have this huge open, open area. It's huge. It it really is big, and it does not look that big on this shot right here because of the fisheye. There's a good angle of it. So I put myself further away from the mountain because the wind was blowing towards the mountain. So I knew if in an incident I or my glider would be drifting back towards the mountain, towards this big open area right here. And I can't stress how massive it is. But at the same time, I'm 3,000 feet high. And I kid you not, my glider landed, oh, come on. It landed on this house. It was either this house or this house, right next to the field, <laughs> right on the roof of the house. I could not believe that. But anyway, after I landed, some nice folks came up to me, and they, they asked if I had lost a parachute. And I was like, yep, that was me. You know where it is? And they're like, yeah, we'll take you over to to get it and by the time we drove over to this house some some guy had retrieved it from the roof and had it all wadded up in his car and gave it back to me and yeah it was super nice okay let's let's identify where the problem went wrong here so here is the housing for the ripcord cable and it's pretty clever design you have your your hang point right here you, you got your your third ring which is not shown here in between here and then you have these series of rings that kind of cascade through each other and it increases mechanical advantage for each ring that that is flipped so 
if say we're under a high load, it's still easy to pull the rip cord and release from the risers. So you have your handle here, which routes it through this tubing. And when the handle is pulled, you can see that when this rip cord cable passes through the hole there, this loop is allowed to pass through and it lets all the rings start to open. Okay, so this housing, this is actually where it went wrong. So after I, I landed, I noticed that's what my housing looked like. Let's try to get a better, better view of this here. Um, so I only was able to buy certain lengths of this housing and this is the longest it would go. So this, this housing actually wraps around the back of the harness and up to the other side and it wasn't quite long enough. So I had to splice these small pieces onto it to extend it. And what I came up with was basically just heat shrink to splice them together. And I'm probably having a lot of riggers laughing at me at this right now, but, but I have two layers of, of two different sizes of heat shrink holding this together. And I know there's glue inside the, the heat shrink and I cannot pull this apart with my hands. Um, but apparently it pulled apart as I was flying. So whether it was the weight of the hose itself pulling it apart or whether it was the housing passing through this bungee which kept tension on it, which keeps it at a consistent length for the ripcord length, it ended up unsplicing itself. And when you have this unsplice itself, if you can imagine, you have your, your cable going through the hose. As this hose unsplices, the hose gets longer, and when the hose gets longer, the cable gets shorter. So the cable on my right, on my left side, got shorter and shorter and shorter until finally it released. And that's where I went wrong. So I actually have a good theory of why this might have come unspliced. So here's the swing arm now. You can tell it is absolutely bent. So this this front piece right here, it, it should not be vertical. It actually extends out another several inches out to the front. And so when that got bent inward, the entire swing arm goes up. If, if that makes sense. So normally it would sit about here, but when that bent inward, now the natural position for the swing arm is up higher. And as you pull up, it pulls the hoses up as well. And I think that's what caused it to come unspliced at this end. Oh man. 